Hey, you also have good food to do. Mm. There is that. We're doing a lot today. We're baking bread. I also made uh, cinnamon. Uh, no, was is and spiced muffins for my wife. Yep. And I'm the chef in the house, so I do all the baking and the cooking. Nice. Right. Excellent. What are you yeah. drinking over there? Uh, Guinness. Guinness. It's been a while. <laughs> what are you drinking, my good man? We're drinking uh, Nat- National Bohemian. I think it's oh. a Baltimore, Maryland special. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Okay. Fantastic. A craft beer. Love to hear it. First brewed in 1885. Uh-huh. So they busted out the old recipe. Oh, boy. What a beer, it says on the on the box. Did you feel that <laughs> way when you drank it? No. It's, it's no hams. It's, I'll tell you It's that. trash. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's too bad. Sorry, Baltimore. If you're from Baltimore and you hear this, whatever. Yeah. And whatever. <laughs> This one, it says somewhere on here, seventeen something, seventeen fifty nine for Guinness. There we go. Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. All right. Well, we're hitting record, so we're gonna rock and roll. Boom, 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 boom. boom. All right. Well, hello, hello, and welcome to the Rock and Roll Podcast. I am your host, John Harris. On my right hand side is my right hand man, Gabriel. What did you? And today on the Rock and Roll Podcast, we have Spellbook. We've got a new mm-hmm. album called Magic and Mischief, which is going to be released on September 25th via Cruise Del Sur Music. Right now I'm being joined by Nick and Nate. We're going to have the Nick and Nate morning show. Hey. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Depending on when you're listening to this, it could be the evening show, maybe. Who knows? The Nick and Nate magic and show. The boys are going to be sharing some more information about what they've got going on, what they've been up to. So, boys, welcome to the show. Thank you for having us, Johnny. Thank you. Glad to be here. Absolutely. And you know what? It's not too terribly often I get called Johnny, so I appreciate that. <laughs> I meant no offense. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't I didn't mean it like in an offended way, like, how dare you, sir? <laughs> uh it's just kind of a funny thing. Like I get called a lot of things, but Johnny doesn't happen very often. So uh cool. No, it's, it's definitely not a soft J. It's not a Yon Harris. No, but I suppose it could be. I mean so going back a bit. All right, Yanni Harris. Here we go. Here we go, baby. Uh, my grandmother, who is Romanian, she would call me Jonathan because in in oh, Romanian, that's how you say Jonathan is Jonathan. So go. they're yeah. Jonathan. The soft the soft J is in the family. Heck yeah. Now speaking of other heck yeahs, we have this album we're going to chat about here called Magic and Mischief, which has a killer killer artwork. Uh, I. Could probably start this artwork for the next 10 years. Nice, and yeah. It's, it's pretty rad. We're very happy with how it came out. It, I guess take us through this artwork. So did, was this your guys' concept? You said this is the way it's going to be. Did you give it up to somebody and they just did it? How? This is intense. Mm-hmm. So um, we found um, the artist is uh, Chad Keith. Um, I believe he's from Helsinki, but uh, he's currently living in... Um, California, um, discovered him through this podcast I listen to called the Say You Love Satan podcast. He does a lot of artwork for them, and uh, he's got this really cool, um, it's like eighties, seventies, like horror movie poster, um, style to him. Um, which we are huge fans of, like horror movies and stuff like that, and um. A very unique style, especially his the colors he uses is like very vibrant, very and it's fluorescent, very bright stuff. And um, we've worked with a lot of great artists in our past. Um, Adam Burke, um, who's like blowing up right now. Um, we were going to go back to Adam. Oh, and also um, Rebecca Magar, who did our previous album. Um, so when we were talking about the artwork for this one, we wanted to do something different, something that would stick out a little bit from all the other bands in this genre. Um, like I said, Adam Burke, he's, <laughs> he's doing like every band these days. And so we decided to pick something that would stick out a little more. So I loved his style <laughs> and uh, the concept behind uh, the album cover was we wanted to, incorporate one song like one image from each song on the record to make kind of a collage kind of like movie poster vibe to it so um that's pretty much all i sent to chad and uh 
this is his first take. He sent it to us and it was awesome. So we were super happy with it. Yeah. Really quick. Whoever's phone is next to the microphone keeps going off and that's going to just bludgeon people in the ears. Sorry. It is the current phone we are using. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, that's, that's been Mr. Popular. Turned that's it fantastic. off. We're good. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah, we should be okay. good now. Sorry about that. Oh, no worries. Uh, so there are then seven images. We can one, two, three, four, five. Is am I, or am I missing it? So I guess let's just break it down to Wands to the Sky and Amulet, which are the two uh, singles that have been released. And where do we find those guys on? Well, the amulet, I guess I see it's on the hand, one of the hands, right? Yes. Yes. The uh, the red amulet is being held by the hand. Um, the magic and mish, or sorry, the um, wants of the sky um, is actually the wizard, the decrepit wizard head. Mm-hmm. He's kind of so giving I, me a look. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we basically uh, what I what I gave to him for uh, wants of the sky was just like uh, an old wizard looking guy, and. Uh, so that's what he uh, portrayed coming out. I think of like the the skull, the Grim Reaper looking dude. Okay. Now take us through this wands to the sky. I'm guessing it involves a wizard, even though there's multiple wands. Well, I guess if he's got both wands in his hands, there's two wands to the sky. Right on. Yeah. Uh, the basic um, lyric concept is basically two tribes of magicians and wizards. Um, at war with each other. And uh, the lyrics are basically the one side of the warring wizards and kind of like they're uh, uh, getting ready for battle. Like, here's like the big uh, speech they would give before they go to war with the opposing wizards. Super nerdy stuff. (laughs) <laughs> so it's not necessarily the battle itself because I'm going to ask, well, then who wins? And you probably say, well, you have to listen to the song. Um, it was kind of like, because I just finished watching Outlaw King uh, the other night with the misses, uh, which is about after William Wallace was killed and Robert the Bruce then takes over to fight the English. And so they do that thing in the beginning where, you know, they give the big heroic speech before you go in and kill a bunch of people. So that's yeah. that's that's the big heroic speech. That's what this track is. Pretty much, yeah. If you listen to lyrics, it's it's mainly like the the commander getting his troops ready for war. Okay. Now, dare I say, this song seems a little happy, a little peppy for like going into battle. <laughs> um. Yeah. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> it is a jaunty tune. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um. The music was mainly written by our guitar player Andy Craven, um, who. Um, does come from a power metal background um, from his pr- previous bands. I'd say this is like our most um, Iron Maiden-y, um, new wave of British heavy metal-y kind of sounding song that we've ever written, really. Um, but we, we figured this would be the the opening track just because it's so like in your face, start to finish, just fast and very energetic stuff. That it is. And then we get to Amulet, which is almost a different song altogether. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Amulet. Um, I had written that main lick uh, years and years ago. And I had forgotten about it. Um, but I was going through my laptop of all these old like demo recordings I had. Just out of curiosity of what was in there. And uh, my girlfriend at the time was in the same room and she actually put her book down that she was reading and was like, is that you guys? So like, well, this is just something I came up with. She's like, well, that's pretty good. Um, now for her to say that <laughs> it was huge. I was like, Oh, well maybe we do have something here. So it made me think in, uh, I started crafting the rest of the song, you know, and, um, yeah, it just kind of like wrote itself. It, it was more of a not really a ballad, but it's kind of ballady. Um, 
but straightforward. It, yeah, it's pretty straightforward. Um, probably the best song that I've contributed to the band to this day. And um, yeah, it was kind of like a a fan favorite, you know, ever since we started playing it live. Definitely. Well, I guess it makes sense. I mean, something that uh, I've, if a band ever asked for advice on their song, like people seem to tune out when we're playing our song because like, it sucks. And like, songs, and they hear it all the time. So it's like, yeah. And like, you know, music is a visceral thing. If it, if you've got it right, people are just going to start dancing or they're just going to start headbanging or they're just going to start doing something. Yeah. But if somebody's like, yeah, that's a great song. They're lying to you because they're being nice. And, yeah. and my so, ex-girlfriend had no reason to be nice to me. <laughs> exactly. You know, so the fact that, you know, <laughs> the ultimate test, you've got a girl in the room and she puts her book down and says, uh -huh. that is a true Ooh. testament. Yeah. So and then you tested it on crowds and crowds liked it. And you're like, OK. Um, but I guess my next question then is with regard to that, did you are you guys taking that into account when writing for the future or was that taken into account at all for this particular album? Um, I think overall, like I'm just trying to be a better songwriter in general. Um, you know, our first couple records, you know, like I personally came from a metal background, like thrash and like black metal stuff. So completely different style of songwriting when it comes to that. Um, so being in what, which was Witch Hazel at the time, now it's Spellbook. Um, I've been really like the hardest part is not really coming up with like the most badass riff in the world. The hardest part is cutting the fat off, mm -hmm. discovering like what is the hook, make the the entire song the hook, and that's something I think I'm just always I'm just gonna forever be in search of, you know, which is good. Um. So yeah, going forward, um, I'm definitely way more like not pop conscious, but like kind of pop conscious. Like what, what is just like what you said will naturally get people moving their heads. What will naturally get stuck in somebody's head. So that's kind of where we're at now when it comes to songwriting, still like straight up rock and roll, but also like Let's find these hooks. Let's find the catchiness. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, you know, oddly enough, back speaking of, you know, a deep well of 70s rock, Black Sabbath certainly wasn't pop, but they've got a lot of hooks. Damn oh, great. 100%. Yeah. And, you know, Deep Purple that had like radio hits and stuff like that, you know, so that's what we're aiming towards, you mm -hmm. know, music wise. Yeah. Having that spell book full of the spells that, you can cast on people and then they start spending money on your music. Yes. 100%. <laughs> Once to the sky, baby. Um, what is the amulet? What does the amulet do? Is it like a good luck charm? Is it a bad luck charm? It could be whatever you want. So like, I really don't like when people like dissect the lyrics because it, you know, like if you listen to the song and you dig it and you connect with it and then you have the writer explain what it really is about, it kind of like, oh, well, now I can never hear it the same. You know what I mean? <laughs> so the amulet, you know, is a metaphor for whatever you need it to be. <laughs> it really is. Um, in one way, you can look at it at face value and be like, oh, it's kind of like a Lord of the Rings. This is Gollum talking about his precious, you know, or you can dig further and the amulet can mean whatever you need it to mean for you to like connect to it. So that's my stock answer. And that's all you're going to get. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Perfect. Now we've got two versions of this album. We have the long play, which I'm speculating is vinyl. And then the CD version, which would then be digital. And I noticed that there appears to be, one gleaming difference, and that is Amulet on the LP is just by itself. I'm speculating because there's only so much room physically available on, on vinyl. Correct. 
Um, the CD, which also is a physical medium but can hold significantly more, uh, we then have Fare Thee Well. So what is Fare Thee Well? And I guess you fared it quite well for the LP version. Um, but what is this track and how does it relate to Amulet? Fare Thee Well is the uh, basically the outro to Amulet. And um, when it was written, it was... Um, Supposed to be in mind to be like the closing of the record, and uh, fairly well. It's it's, it's basically a uh, just a big instrumental piece that accompanies the song Amulet. And yeah, you're 100 percent correct. Um, the LP version, um, straight up just ran out of space. So um, if you buy the LP version, you're going to get the single version of Amulet, um, which just you know cuts off you you get it's the whole hunk of the song really um but then if you get the cd version and the digital version includes the uh big opus fare thee well which is just an instrumental uh very haunting very beautiful thing that we orchestrated um that was written entirely in the studio mainly yeah a lot of it was in the studio from our friend uh mike kiker um, from the band um, St. James. James and the Apostles we have him come that's like our, our piano, keyboard synth guy, organ guy he contributed a lot to the uh, outro to that so that's the the main difference between the single version and Fare Thee Well Fare Thee Well is just a big outro to the song Amulet I, I hear like a 7 inch EP speaking of vinyl coming along and it'll include Fare thee well on the on the A side, and then something else on the B side to tease some people with what's coming next. That would be awesome. We would love that, man. Mm-hmm. Beautiful, beautiful. Now, something that I had taken some notes on um, during our chat is uh, it seems like the the album has been kind of been written over over the course of time, inadvertently, inadvertently. Um, you know, finding some licks that you'd written some, a few years ago, having some guest musicians coming in, writing tracks. You know, in the studio. Um, I guess the question is, at what point did you guys know you had an album's worth of material and what was the goal or what did you guys set out to create with um, Magic and Mischief? For us, it, the main thing, we've been DIY going back to the Witch Hazel years um, and have just gotten the... Uh, the kind of the, the attaboys, you know, like, man, this is really good stuff. Like going back to our debut record and, and no one's playing stuff like you guys are, especially in the States. And, but it just, it just flew under the radar. You know what I mean? And like, we're, um, the bands we would play with would be like, man, we dig this and we want to play with you again. But like, it just didn't gain much traction, uh, until our good friend now, Darren, uh, McCloskey from the band Pell Divine. So it was Chevy, Biesel Fuzz, uh, who else? Help me. You know, the days of the uh, and spillage and spillage. I'm sorry, from Chicago. Yeah, uh, days of the Doom tour that came to our hometown here in New York, and we were the opening band for it. And it it just you know that's our stomping grounds. It's a comfortable place for us to play. We always play well there. And so like we're playing uh, the Witch Hazel otherworldly material, and then we played Amulet. And I remember getting off the stage, and Darren came up and it was like holy shit was that what was that last song you played or next to last song i'm like ah it's, it's a new one it's called amulet and he's like that's gonna be on the record right i'm like actually no that's next record like it's not on this other world and he's like dude do you think you guys got something here he uh i sent him uh, immediately from there he was all but daily chats with him and like send me other world so i sent him that he's like this is great this is amazing and and uh, he started putting it in people's ears for us. He really did. And we started getting some attention with it. Um, not enough for a deal. Um, but uh, he, he, I remember he, he told me, he's like, so what are you guys doing for this next album? I'm like, well, we, we have it all written, you know, and obviously Amulet's on it. And uh, would you shop around yet and stuff? And we're like, yeah, you know, we, a couple places. And, you know, it, it was too unique. We, we've gotten that that answer a lot over the years. It's it's too different. It's too this. It's too that. We're too much like Kiss. <laughs> Another label said we're too progressive. <laughs> we're too progressive. Other oh. label said we're not doom enough. 
Oh, we've heard it all. Yeah, it was, it was awesome. <laughs> but it, but it was literally him as like he's like it. He's like I cannot let this happen for this song. Just this song. He's like your other songs on that album are great too. But he's like this cannot happen for you guys. You just put this out yourself again. And he's like so he he convinced us that like we need to shop harder like you know like really put it out there and not just you know the first three or four news you get and then do it all yourself like we typically do and uh yeah he basically just you know convinced us like we're deserving band we're we, we knew we were a good live band we did know that um and like this he's like if this reaches more people he's like people are going to dig this and also Amulet was like the last song that Amulet almost made our other album, otherworldly, but it just timing wise, we didn't have enough time to really tighten it up and finish it up. So Amulet did not make the otherworldly record, which is our previous record, but we were still playing it live. And that's Amulet's really the song that really got assigned, to be honest. Yeah. Wow. I was going to ask that. How did Cruz get into the whole picture? That that was Darren, like saying, "Hey, like, you know, check Hale, these guys out." Like, Hale Divine had just recently signed with Cruz Del Sur. Yeah, and they were. We and he said they were looking for more talent, and he's like, "Well, hey, I know these guys. Like, they're they're planning on doing it the, themselves again." And he's like, "I, it would be, <laughs> you know, I, I think he said it would be criminal if this went out." You know, just by themselves again, and uh, you know, <laughs> a thousand people were going to hear it. Like, you know, like check us out, and like, so they they took it seriously. Uh, and I, by hell, at, at that time we had the full version of the album. But, yeah, by that time we had already recorded the full record of Magic and Mischief, so we, we actually had that ready to go to send to, to, labels. to labels. So, and they uh, they picked it up. They really liked it, and support. They're supporting us like we've never. Yeah, had before, so like that's, that's great. That's why we're talking to you right now, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I did cruise. I've had many, many of their roster on, and they seem to be a uh, a great label and have a lot of incredible talent as well on their roster. They really do. 100%. I mean, we, we're discovering the bands that are on it. Like I knew, I knew like maybe one or two, but like I've over these you know months, I've been going through their roster. And it's like, damn, they got some really good stuff on here, and it makes sense that we would be on like it, it the other bands that are on the <laughs> label it's like yeah like we fit here yeah yeah i get what you're saying it's kind of sad if i like there's a lot of great bands on there i understand why we're here we're also a great band everybody well i mean like genre wise <laughs> style wise oh yeah and yes no, I, we're the best band ever yeah no i know i know what to expect when when i get a cruise email basically you know hp lovecraft or conan the barbarian or something you know new wave of british heavy metal or something something like that totally yeah sweet now i guess the only thing left to cover that we haven't covered yet is this phenomenal year of good luck that has been bestowed upon us and i guess because this is going to be released in september was has it been delayed because of what's been going on this year or is it just kind of things were going to happen the way they were. How has this year changed aside from the obvious of touring and shows? Uh, how has this year changed what you guys have planned or been doing? Um, the album was always going to be coming out September 25th. Um, despite all the, the craziness happening now. So um, uh, as far as the release of the record, things have been going as planned. Um, but yeah, like you said, um, we're not playing any shows this year, um, which is a bummer, but totally understand why. And we wouldn't want to, to be honest, we've gotten offers to play shows. And it's like, are you crazy? Like, whatever, but I'm not going to get into that. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> smash um, mouth, anyone. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, basically, uh, when all this hit, we, uh, took the first three four months off you know everyone's just quarantining down here well we were at least and um we decided it was you know safe enough to where we know enough now to where we can actually get together in a room safely and start rehearsing again even though you know not for shows so basically 2020 for spellbook has been the release of magic and mischief and writing the next record which we already have 
the next record pretty much planned out already. Okay. Now, I guess my next question then is, are you guys going to start recording said record, like maybe in your own personal studios and having that maybe mixed and mastered by somebody else in their studio or how, I guess, what should we expect for uh, the next album? Next album at the earliest would be 2021. The late, but yeah, you know, like even though um, we have about like half of it written already, it's going to be a, a while till we finish the actual music B where this country is going to be, you know, like, I don't think we could go to a studio right now to like record. Like it's, it's pretty bad down here, dude. <laughs> um, so we'll see what 2021 looks like. Hopefully we can have a new album out by that year, like end of 2021. But as of right now, like, everything is just like up in the air. So all we can really do and focus on is just writing music and promoting the crap out of, you know, our, this how magic mischief. Yeah. Makes sense. And they get the ex-girlfriend involved in the writing and God uh, damn it. And she's got the ear, man. She knows, you know, so they'd be like, Hey, her. pick up a book really quick. Why? Just do it. <laughs> <laughs> my new girlfriend would love that by the way. <laughs> I bet you would. That'd be a, Oh Mike, What's that song from that band? Oh, of course this is going to go somewhere real fast. Hinder. Was it Hinder? <laughs> Oh, Christ. Uh, Girl, why are you calling me so late? It's not that kind of phone call. It's more like, are you dancing? Did you put the book down yet? Um, you already lost me, John. I'm sorry. <laughs> what are you talking about? What's this John, band hinder? John with a soft J. Uh, <laughs> hinder. That's funny. Should, I should listen to them. But That was bad. That was 2005 in a nutshell. Um, yeah, really. <laughs> We got Hinder, Sweet. Seether, Breaking Benjamin, Saving Abel. Yeah. Yeah, the, the pinnacle of rock and roll. It was the pinnacle of rock and roll. And then on the other side of it, you had Metalcore exploding. Oh, my God. Here we go. I know. Here we, all this. here we go. You're going to stay out of this. I was, I was into the melodic death metal at that point. All the bands out of Finland and Sweden and Norway. So There was a fine line between bands like... I don't like I remember like Black Dahlia Murder, their first record came out. And I was like, okay, this is pretty cool, a little different. But there's a difference between that and like I don't know. I don't even know who to reference. Um <laughs> just get into the time exactly. machine. Go back to two thousand and five. Shadows Fall was a thing. Yeah. I like Shadows uh, Fall. All that remains or is that or is that a little bit later? All that remains unearthed. Oh yeah, on Earth. Right? Yeah. God, who else? As I lie dying, are they metalcore? Uh, they sure are. I think they started off as just hardcore, and then they went into metalcore after that. Their sound changed somewhere after was it ninety four hours or ninety eight hours or ninety some odd hours. See, this is where I just. It all just kind of sounds the same to me. I don't even understand the core <laughs> on anything. It, for me, it's like you have 60s rock, 70s rock, and 80s rock. And then like everything else is just like, I don't even know what you're talking about. I enjoy yeah. grindcore. I Whoa. love me some Napalm Death. Oh, my. But when it comes to uh, like metalcore and deathcore, like that's when you lost me. I, I'm like an old school death metal guy. Post this. Post that. Uh -oh. Post melodic progressive death. Uh, yeah, fantasy core post metal yeah not that there's anything wrong with that I just don't know jack about it I guess wow <laughs> cool <laughs> well guys that concludes all the questions that I have for you is there anything that you wanted to bring up that I did not ask um just that spell book magic and mischief comes out September 25th on Cruz del Sur music you can pre-order it now on uh spellbookband.bandcamp.com or uh, Cruz del Sur music.com if you're overseas. And uh, that's basically where we're at. And, uh, dude, thank you so much for having us, man. Yeah, thanks, John. Appreciate it, man. Yeah, absolutely. I was going to thank you, but then you thank me. We're thanking each other. This is great. You're the most energetic guy we've talked to so far. <laughs> and we love it. We already have the... What's going on, Scooty? What's up? We already have the re-raised 
of the album already in a question. <laughs> so you hmm? don't need a well tell oh. that. Well you actually need to tell the people, but we have the release day and the questions. So they're just saying that, that your daddy is uh uh enjoying an interview, unlike apparently some interviewers hate their lives. What? Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> oh dude. Yeah. I mean like Again, like this is new to us, so it's like, oh yeah, we have another interview to do on Thursday. I'm psyched. This is like the best part of my day. Beautiful. We're just local guys, you know what I mean? <laughs> well, I, I I don't know that. I'm like, oh, I gotta talk to Spellbook. Um, so you know, we both just got off work. Yep. Life sucks. <laughs> like, <laughs> we're drinking sh- shit beer. So yes, th- thank you so much for your time and like. Thank you for promoting this, man. We really appreciate it. 